Hello, everyone. Hope you're all enjoying this. We were just talking about the beginning of mud season here, at least a couple days at a time. So Joe is joining us here from Maine today. Um, he recently completed his PhD at the University of Maine, working with Jasmine Soros. And very excitedly, he is joining um, the Science Museum of Minnesota in St. Croix as a postdoc at the Watershed Research Center. So um, that is just wonderful news and we're all very excited for him and for, this, uh, <clears throat> for the station. So today, Joe is going to be talking to us about three-dimensional modeling of diatoms. Take it away. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm both very excited to have uh, completed my PhD here at the University of Maine and excited to go over to Minnesota to potentially advance some of these ideas. So largely today, I'll be focused on three aspects in diatoms in 3D. So first I'll give you a little bit of the inspiration behind this project and then show a couple ways to create 3D models. Um, I'm going to touch on some of the research applications that I developed both in my dissertation work and elsewhere. And then I'm gonna share some future goals and some ideas that I think could be really useful to advance diatom uh, taxonomy, diatom ecology, and some other cool uh, potential future applications. So first of all, um, the inspiration for these projects and, and this line of research actually comes directly out of teaching. During my master's at Indiana State University studying under Jeffrey Stone, uh, we had a 3D printer kind of show up in the department and we're told uh, you can use this kind of figure out what to do with it. Um, so I had a little bit of modeling background from a couple of classes in high school. And we decided that a good line to use the 3D printers was to teach a little bit about diatoms and diatom taxonomy, because uh, there's a bit of a hurdle, I think, when you start diatom work. Um, getting used to a microscope and looking at microscopic images where with the 3D printer, we could just print them out and then you can, you can hold a model of a diatom and, and pick at the spines or look at specific features to say, oh, that's what a rimaportula is, things like that. So the 3D printing process itself um, starts with a 3D model and then is turned into what's called G-code, which is basically just a programming language that um, tells the printer how much material should be placed in what location. Uh, and then you get to watch it print out in real time, uh, something like this. These are about three inch models. Uh, they might take about 45 minutes to print on this particular printer. So it's a, it's a tangible amount of time. You can kind of sit there, watch them print out. And then at the very end, you get this cool little hockey puck sized uh, diatom, which is really fun to show uh, new students or um, kids or you know, potentially uh, people visiting the lab. Um, it's always fun to have some 3D models of diatoms on hand. So just a note that when I'm talking about 3D models, I've kind of split the models into two broad categories, which I've called teaching quality models and research quality models. So teaching quality model is in this example are the yellow uh, Starosorella pinatas up in the top right, where you can see on here that they're a bit rudimentary, they look a little pixelated, and it's because they're created 
in some fairly simple software that uh, is easy to pick up. You can teach or at least approximate how to use this uh, free software to make things that look like diatoms and you could print them out and kind of show somebody what a diatom is. The other broad category is a research quality model. And now on the bottom left is Stephanodiscus Nyagari, which was created using fairly rigorous measurements. Um, it is approximately taxonomically accurate and contains the correct amount of components and size distribution and is or should be fairly accurate to represent this species. And when you're choosing what to uh, model or how to model it, uh, you kind of got to start at what your goal is. So if you're an educator and you want to teach people about diatom morphology or get people excited about diatoms, uh, you could start with some of the free software such as Tinkercad. And in over the course of, of maybe an afternoon, you could give some students some microscope images of a diatom and you can go on to Tinkercad and actually do 3D modeling right in your web browser. You don't have to download any sort of software. And as an educator, you can have your educator account and give out assignments and go and look at what your students have been creating. Um, it's a pretty quick learning curve. The software allows you to add simple shapes, remove simple shapes, and um, I think people pick it up pretty quick. If your goal is to produce some kind of data or um, explore some aspect of diatom taxonomy, ecology, paleontology, uh, then I would encourage you to turn towards some more professional software, such as Autodesk's AutoCAD, CATIA, or SolidWorks. Many of these have um, at least free trials for educators if you have uh, some kind of institutional account. And many institutes will have licenses for these through your engineering department, uh, which is how I was able to get um, and do most of my work on AutoCAD. So teaching and outreach, um, just to go over pretty quickly, I made this model in Tinkercad. And I typically start with an outline and then revolve it around the axis uh, for a centric diatom. Uh, you can add in some spines, remove the various processes, and then flip it over on itself. So you have both parts of your diatom, both valves to make up the frustral. And then that final image on the bottom right is what this model is actually represented by. So all of that modeling can be reduced to a very small amount of data, those few lines. Uh, make up the, the complete model and you boil it down to a wireframe model. Then we go back to our model. So we've created it. We'll dump it into the G code, print one out, and then we can handle it, play with it, pass it off to our friends. And when you're giving lectures, I find it pretty nice to have a, a diatom model on hand because it makes it very quick to explain concepts that we diatomists might be rather familiar with, but a more general science audience uh, might not be. So it's very quickly in one slide, I can teach you what one valve is. I can teach you that there's an epivalve and a hypovalve that make up the frustral. And I can show you that alakasira can form chain filaments. And I can use a little bit of color to show each individual cell in the chain. We can also use them to highlight various parts of a diatom. 
where on microscope images, we have little arrows that kind of show and are maybe hard to see. So we can use an, a scanning electron image. Um, but once we create our 3D model, we can very easily just add a little bit of uh, flavor to these and say, oh, that green feature is the rim of portula, and that purple feature is a fulta portula, and here's where they reside within the cell. We can also use them to show a concept that maybe isn't preserved in a fossil record. So the images on the left are a set of images of a fossil species. And then we create a 3D model of a sororella and can join them back together via the girdle bands to kind of give a sense of while we're looking at these images on the left, here's what the actual organism would have looked like on the right and on the bottom right. And these are a couple examples Matt Brindle described um, from Africa. They're about 3 million years old. And here's another example of one of these where we have our microscope images on the left and then our models on the right and a complete frustral on the bottom right. I'll take a moment to note the link in the bottom left there for Thingiverse, which is a digital repository for, for pretty much all 3D models. Uh, many 3D models are free to download, use, print um, under various licenses. I do have all of the models that I'll show today up on Thingiverse. And if you want to, you can go search for diatoms on there. Uh, when I started the project, I think I was the only person making diatoms and putting them on Thingiverse. And since I have seen uh, a few more modelers from around the world pop up and start putting in diatoms. So it's pretty cool to see the community expanding there. So that kind of covers teaching quality models. If we want to do a little bit of modeling for research, this is where I would turn to some professional software so that we can make them extremely accurate. Um, and the example I use throughout the rest of this is from uh, Autodesk. It's called AutoCAD. Uh, I find it useful. Um, it's the program that I learned to start with, but I think you can have just as much success with other software such as CATIA or SOLIDWORKS. Um, they have various nuances, but all are, are pretty good at doing their job. So I'll show you the process for creating the Stephanodiscus Nyagari. That was the, the focus of my dissertation research. So again, I'm starting with an outline. So we can see just that these are just lines drawn on a piece of paper, essentially. And then in the computer environment, we can revolve those lines around the central axis to create kind of this discoid shape that Stephanodiscus is known for. We can poke a bunch of holes in it to remove the areole, tack on our rimaportula, our mantle fultiportula, and then encompass the stephanodiscus in its um, crown of spines. Very easily, we can copy this one, flip it over to have our uh, epi and hypo valve, and then throw on a girdle band to make sure the thing sticks together. So that is our example of how to build a research quality model. And uh, there's a lot of back work in making sure it's taxonomically accurate and that all the holes are the right size and the spines are the right length, but um, I won't bother showing all of the measurement data here. So now that we've created our research quality model, um, 
I'm going to share a few aspects of how I've used these or this particular model to inform research about diatom taxonomy, um, trait function, and ecological uh, variations. And the inspiration for this stemmed all the way back to those first original models I was making um, during my master's. So a really interesting thing happens when you go to print out one of these models. And it's from this engineering standpoint where this little box pops up. And when you go to print it, it shows you how much filament or how much of the plastic it is going to use to print that particular model. So in this case, the filament weight was 750 grams. Uh, and that was a bit of an aha moment where I said, oh, that's the filament weight. But if this was a really accurate model, that would be telling me the exact amount and volume of silica dioxide that this particular specimen was using to create its frustule. Um, so that kind of led into this idea that I could use these 3D models to improve biovolume estimates, and then not only improve biovolume estimates, actually parse out the individual silica dioxide amount per specimen, uh, per species, and then expand that out to a population. Uh, I'm also going to show a little bit of trait function modeling, showing how spines influence hydrodynamics, and then a little bit of dabbling into ecological and paleolimnology insights of what we can do with these models. So first of all, we've created one research quality model, and now we need to cover the whole uh, size diminution of Stephanodiscus Nyagiri. For this, I had a population from Herd Lake, Idaho, that was really confined within uh, about 75 to 35 microns. So I created nine models at five micron increments to cover that population size range. And then plotting this up on a curve, we can see our diameter to biovolume ratio. And so this is the total biovolume of that frustule. And we can compare it to um, previous biovolume estimates and see that a cylinder, um, which would have been used to estimate the biovolume of Stephanodiscus nyagari previously, is overestimating biovolume and especially so at that higher size range up into the 70 and 75 micron range. The other thing we can do is parse out the, the frustule volume or just the valve volume and show what the volume of silica dioxide is and turn that into a simple equation. So the previous slides were the total biovolume or, or entire cell volume. And then this graph is showing the relationship of diameter on the x-axis to the valve volume. So individual valves amount of silica dioxide on the y-axis. The next thing that we can do is because we created this model, um, we can do some trait function modeling. So I put the spines on, and now I'm really interested. I want to see what do spines do to the sinking rate of a diatom, because there's many hypotheses and ideas about what spines do. Are they anti-predatory? Do they act like little parachutes? Um, something like that. And within this 3D environment, I can go back and say, oh, I'll just take the spines off. So I have two models now for this simulation, this simulated experiment. So the blue is sort of the, the real life model. This is what Stephanodiscus Nyagari looks like. And the orange is kind of the what if experimental model. So what if Stephanodiscus Nyagari didn't have spines? How would that influence 
its hydrodynamics or its sinking rate. So I can put this into computational fluid dynamics software. And what that will do is solve Navier-Stokes equations, um, which were originally devised to find the sinking rate of spherical objects. Um, but with these powerful computers we have now, uh, we can use them to solve complex shapes. So I set up a simulated experiment across the size range, uh, both with and without spines. And the results of which can be shown fairly simply to show that the model or the experimental group, the what if Stephanodiscus nigari did not have spines, orange model on the left, is sinking quicker than the true to life blue model on the right. So if we wanna graph this up, we can watch that sink one more time and then freeze it on the, back, on the last time frame. And then our, our graphs show us the distance that each model has sank across time. And in each case, the blue control model or the real life stephanodiscus with spines uh, takes longer to sink the same amount or is sinking slower, so to speak. Um, this is really showing us that these spines resist flow or resist change. They give it kind of a extra inertia, so to speak. Um, and then each pane or each facet it, uh, is across the size range. So the 35 micron diameter models at the top, we can see take much longer than the uh, slower, quicker sinking, uh, larger models. Um, so not only do spines make diatoms sink slower, we can also simulate and find out that smaller diatoms sink slower than the large ones within the population, which is something we kind of already knew or had hints of that smaller diatoms sink uh, slower and have different mixing conditions um, from, from natural experiments in lakes. And what we're showing here is that this suggests that that trend uh, holds true within a population of diatoms. So within a population, the larger diatoms are going to sink faster than the smaller diatoms, which I think has probably some, some interesting implications that I haven't quite thought over um, for what that means for the diatom diminution series and the diatom sex clock, trying to figure out, you know, okay, so we have different sinking rates for different size within a population. You know, what does that mean for sexual reproduction in diatoms? So, so I'm kind of excited to pursue these lines of research in the, in the future. Jumping back to our uh, ecology and paleolimnology insights, uh, a few things we can do with these is we can parse out the amount of silica dioxide that is used in each ultrastructure. So how much silica does it take to make a spine? Or you know, how much silica is this species investing in spines? And then what sort of benefit does it get from that? Uh, we can compare silica dioxide use across the population size dynamics. Um, and then we can figure out and add them all up to say, what does the diatom silica pool and uh, consist of in a population and how does that interact with nutrient and climate cycles? So first of all, we find that silica dioxide can be parsed out per ultrastructure. Uh, one example that I keep coming back to are the spines. 
So in these models, we find that spines uh, cost a considerable amount of silica dioxide, especially at the smaller size. So some of these smaller models uh, is, is almost a quarter of the silica dioxide that this uh, particular specimen uses is directly used in the spine construction, um, which I find rather interesting uh, to, to show that, wow, they, you know, these smaller diatoms really invest a lot of their nutrient resources into spine construction. The other thing we can do is compare silica dioxide use across a population. So to put that simply, one large uh, diatom, so a 75 micron Stephanodiscus niagari, uses the same amount of silica dioxide as 14 of the smaller models, or 35 micron, uh, which has some pretty interesting implications if we're considering population dynamics and silica use across the life cycle of a population of diatoms. So to investigate this, this line in particular a bit further, I turned to a sediment core taken out of Herd Lake, Idaho, to investigate how do diatom silica dioxide pool interact with nutrient and climate cycles. Um, so this particular lake is just chock full of Stephanodiscus niagari. It's like five to 50% of the diatom community uh, each year. It's in a pretty undisturbed wilderness. It has an extremely abundant sediment package. Um, and it's just crazy productive. So one gram of sediment has about 10 to 20 million valves diatom valves per gram uh, and, and a typical lake sediment or a, you know, a fairly normal lake sediment might be in the hundreds of thousands of valves per gram, just to give some context. So it made it really easy to find enough Stephanodiscus niagari to do these comparisons. The other fun thing about Herd Lake is that the entire thing is varved. So not only could I find these diatom populations, I could resolve them at annual layers to compare to uh, weather patterns in the region. And then they're so thick, they're about a centimeter thick per year that I was able to sample each year individually. And then using some methods developed by Spalding, on a flow cam cytometer, I was able to find the population size dynamics of Stephanodiscus niagari, not only across a few years, but for um, the entirety of the core, really. So here I present the last um, about 100 years, going back to 1927. Um, which in this region, we have pretty good weather and climate uh, data going back to. So on the left pane, we have our frequency data. So uh, across our diameter, so the number of individual valves at each diameter um, in, a, in a single micron bins is how that left pane is created. And then we have this ridge plot on the right pane to show that population size dynamic or frequency distribution across time, uh, going back to about 1927. So this is all something we could have done before. Uh, the next step, and what I did to analyze the diatom silica pool within this population of Stephanodiscus nigeri was to add in our um, volume per size class or multiply by that volume formula that we found earlier. So we take our size frequency data, funnel it through our volume, uh, our valve volume formula, and we end up with volume per size class. 
and we do that across the entirety of the core. So now we're estimating the silica dioxide that is contained within each population of Stephanodiscus niagari for, in this case, the past about 100 years. And what that is going to show us is a couple of new parameters in our stratigraphic plot. So if we're going back in time on our y-axis, and we have these various variables of weather and climate and nutrients and these diatom variables. Uh, so typically, we would look at the abundance of species. And now we can add in a couple of new parameters, the, the size of Stephanodiscus niagari, and then multiply by our volume calculation and convert to mass. So now we have the mass of silica dioxide that Stephanodiscus niagari has buried each year going back to about 1927. Um, now this is some considerable mess on trying to wiggle match or um, trying to parse out trends in this data. So for this particular, you know, what is driving Stephanodiscus nightberry size and what might be driving Stephanodiscus silica dioxide pool, um, we'll turn to some better analyses that could reveal some insights. So this mess is the results of a path analysis or a structural equation model. And um, basically what we have is a bunch of variables and their influences on each other. So uh, a large green arrow means a positive uh, either correlation or effect. And a large red arrow means a large negative effect. Um, so this is a bit of a mess, so I'll, I'll kind of highlight some pieces as we go through here. So what we find to the question, what might control Stephanodiscus size throughout this? Uh, down in the bottom right, we can see a bunch of arrows converging on a variable called S Niagari size. So something like the annual temperature has a huge green arrow that's pushing uh, up on Stephanodiscus Niagari size to show that in warmer years, uh, this particular species tends to be larger. Um, in uh, so what we're what we're sort of looking at here is that perhaps warmer years induce sexual reproduction. Right, so diatoms reduce size over their uh, asexual reproduction. And then the only way to get larger diatoms is to induce sexual reproductions. So what we're looking at in this herd lake record is that annual temperature seems to probably induce sexual reproduction and maybe a little bit of extra nitrogen helps that process too. So perhaps longer summers or um, because this species is tends to be thought of or tends to be found as a stratification specialist, there's a long enough time in the summer for the diatoms to reach sexual maturity and then reproduce. Uh, so that's kind of one idea of why the warmer temperatures could induce sexual reproduction. Some other interesting findings from this is that uh, warmer winters and warmer springs tend to favor smaller diatoms. So perhaps that has something to do with spring mixing um, or earlier ice off, more phosphorus in the snowpack perhaps. Um, so that's, those are kind of our major findings for what controls the size of this population. And then if we run that through our valve volume formula, we can ask what controls the silica dioxide pool that is trapped in Stephanodiscus niagari. 
So this, at a population level, the variables of the, the silica dioxide pool and the size yeah. dynamics actually act as independent variables. There are no significant correlation between the population dynamic and the silica dioxide pool. Um, so that in itself is kind of an interesting aspect that suggests that this total silica dioxide concept is a, a unique property um, that is not directly controlled by the size dynamics. Um, so what does control it? We find that oxidized phosphorus increases the silica pool that's trapped. Um, not too sure about the, the chemistry or possible mechanisms that would induce that. But we also find that summer precipitation uh, increases the silica dioxide. Um, and there's a super, super tiny arrow going from El Nino to summer precipitation and then to Stephanodiscus nigeri. Um, and I only put it in here because that was kind of one of the original thoughts behind this barbed record is that we could explore potentially what El Nino might be driving in the system. And it, it just really is too far removed and not very large. So I, I don't think it's of major consequence. Um, something that decreases the silica dioxide pool in this particular population is total phosphorus. Um, so I'm wondering, is this a weathering indicator? And I'm not really sure of the mechanism here where uh, oxidized phosphorus and total phosphorus have slightly different push and pull. So in the last few minutes um, of the presentation, I'll touch on some future goals and ideas, uh, kind of pose the ideas of some digital uh, diatom library, maybe a Donna project page, um, and then uh, an idea for maybe herbaria and typification. Um, so within our nomenclature for, for taxonomy, um, occasionally holotypes, lectotypes, or neotypes are designated as illustrations where the actual specimen was maybe lost or destroyed or was a microscope image from long ago that has been turned into just a drawing. So if we can accept that 3D models are a form of illustration, then I'm kind of pushing for the idea that we could use 3D modeling uh, perhaps as paratypes. Uh, we could create digital herbaria for diatoms, uh, which would increase accessibility to our holotypes and uh, diatom science in general. Um, and paleontology has been doing this for a number of years for paleontology um, repositories. Uh, and then the other advantage that I think is really neat is that you can create you know, close to an infinite number of copies so if you lose a holotype or your holotype is destroyed somehow, um, you have an immediate paratype that is essentially available and, and infinite. So it, it could potentially uh, close the doors on some arguments about, you know, what is this species concept? Well, I can just pull it up. I have the model right here. Um, for something like this, I would suggest uh, using scanning electron microscopes to conduct photogrammetry. Um, so this is an example uh, that uh, Stone and Padello at uh, Indiana State University put together on another stuff in a discus. So if we take enough images from sort of this, this cloud cluster around a single specimen, then photogrammetry software such as Agisoft can create a 3D model image or illustration directly of a, a specific specimen. So if this is your holotype or paratype uh, specimen, you can make a replica of it and 
It requires no modeling skills. It creates a 3D image or model of a specific specimen. Here's an example from June Lake of a Stephanid discus. And then you can print it out. You can, you can go here, here's the paratype. This is what this species is. Um, and you can manipulate it, you can hold it, you can print it out, give it to all your friends and say, here, this is this species I'm talking about. And this is a, a really interesting tool that paleontologists have been using to share uh, rather fragile holotypes. So the Museum of Paleontology at the University of Michigan has this uh, online interactive interface where you can browse through their collection. They've done 3D photogrammetry on many of their specimens. And then uh, you can go in and, and actually manipulate the model. You can take measurements so that pane on the right is showing from end to end is 6.808 centimeters. So you no longer have to travel to a repository to take measurements. You can measure anything and everything you could ever want directly out of this online interface, um, which I think would be really cool and useful to integrate into diatom research. And of course, uh, I have many, many helpers to thank throughout the course of this research. So this is the list of, of everyone and all the institutes that I need to thank and many more. So thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, I think we'd like to open it up to questions now. You can um, put them in the chat line uh, and I'll read them out for you. I have a question. You, um, you know, just some of it actually with the last few slides about the photogrammetry. Um, short of doing that, is it technologically possible with say AutoCAD to, to scan basic images, light, uh, light microscopy? Um, <clears throat> images into AutoCAD as opposed to drawing by hand um, or creating those models by hand? Can you scan an image and build up from that? So if you have different angles of a mm -hmm. specimen, you can use a photogrammetry software um, and, and the quality of model that it will output is gonna be based on the uh, the number of different angles of that specimen. Um, so from light microscopy, it's a bit difficult unless you have something to tilt and change the pitch to get multiple angles. Um, something I've played with but didn't show here was trying to sort of trick the software by using different specimens of these, you know, when they happen to settle at different angles right. and, and just tell it, this is the same individual. It, it works with some uh, success, but it tends to uh, not really know how to handle the fact that not all the spines are in the right orientation or something like that. So, so basically, yes. Um, but again, it, it comes back to, you know, what are your goals for the, the 3D model that you're trying to make? Um, so, so, yeah, yeah, you can do it. <laughs> yes, with qualifications. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a couple mentions about what a great talk it was. Um, there's you. also a question from David. Um, can or have you, or, expand on the diatom seeking models to include the comparison of a colony versus a single cell? So I have not. Um, there have been a couple papers that come out of the marine uh, diatom realm where they look at colonies sinking, you know, filament versus individual. Um, and they 
you know, they kind of roughly approximate it with like cylinders that are attached by springs with a various degrees of springiness, so to speak. Um, so there's, there's a number of studies that you can come across that have uh, sort of that, that colony versus individual idea. Um, and then to, to jump off of that, the other thing that these do is because we're at such low Reynolds number is that each individual interacts with the water around it so that the other step is to then sort of model or what I'd like to do is to model you know a bloom to show um, you know kind of how many individuals does it take to start messing with the viscosity properties of the water yeah. um, so that's another idea and what the trouble you tend to run into with these is computational power so anything more than what I've shown on here, you start to need to use a, a, a pretty advanced computing cluster. Um, so that's another sort of a next step and future goal that I have, yeah. I see that Sarah has her hand up. Hi. Um, thank you, Joe. Um, I'm really intrigued by Heard Lake in <laughs> Idaho. What a uh, unusual site that you've got a centimeter of deposition a year and um, creating VARs. And now you talked about um, silica and phosphorus within the diatoms themselves, but you didn't talk about what the concentrations were in this water. And I imagine that they must be pretty significant to drive those kind of populations. Yeah, so, so I pulled up here, um, if you can see it, this is the entire core from Herd Lake. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's centimeter of farves per year for basically its entire existence, about 1300 years. Um, and then, yeah, so one of the major sort of missing components from this whole research is actually knowing the current water conditions of this lake. Um, so it was cored in 2013 with intentions of going back and doing some field sampling. Uh, we know it's hyper eutrophic. Um, you can kind of tell that from satellite images even. Um, and then in 2014, it was designated as a wilderness um, which has made access quite difficult. Um, so I, I don't know the actual uh, concentrations of silica and phosphorus in, in the modern lake system, which is a bit unfortunate. But there's definitely a, you know, a whole set of, of future research to go back and do with that. It, it must been, be in some volcanic zone. Is that? Yep. Yeah, so it's in the geology. salmon chalice volcanics field. So just tons of loose appetite mm. floating around, which is just chock full of phosphorus. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, amazing. And and you know, I'm just wondering, you know, that could really drive too if you got these really high silica concentrations. Um, but yeah, what a what a neat place. Um, I also wanted to just in, um, hear what you how you think about the uh, chitin with fibrils within Stephanodiscus, which of course are really the, the big things keeping them from sinking. Um, do you know how long those extend to? And have you thought about including those in your modeling exercise? Yeah, um, I don't have a, a data set to sh you know show how long these these you know fibules extend off of them um, I've thought about including something like this and it's yeah you know for for the purposes of the dissertation I wanted to focus on you know what is this specific trait function and, and can I model one specific trait and its influence on on the hydrodynamics, but yeah, I would need to, 
essentially add, you know, these these sort of springy um, aspects off of you know coming off of each diatom, and then add that back into the model. So it's something I've thought about. It's not something I have the computational power to do on my personal computer. So I, I think hooking up to a, a computing cluster is really going to be one of the, the next big goals for this to, to start addressing um, you know things like a diatom bloom or how does the, the, the mucus secreted and these you know various right. colony arrangements. So yeah, that'll that would be a really fun project as well. Yeah, thanks so much, Joe. Thank you. I think Julianne is muted. Sorry about that. It's trying to not. <laughs> um, I'm hoping Sylvia can go ahead and follow up uh, Sarah's question about the lake layers with her own question or comments. If Sarah would like, or if Sylvia would like to do that at this point. I think she's muted. Um, oh, here I can ask Silly. Oh, Silly had a question, right? Yes. What was what was the reason behind the annual varv layers in the sediment of of the lake that you studied? What, do you know why it was a varv lake? Yeah. So this lake's pretty interesting um, in it both its formation and then its varves. So it was formed in a valley. Um, a, a sort of a, a little stream valley that around 1300 years ago or around the year 300 CE, uh, a landslide occurred, dammed up the valley and created this like really cone shaped deep uh, lake. So between it being relatively small and quite deep, it's a, it was about 20 meters deep when it formed, and now it has about 11 meters of uh, sediment in the bottom of it. So it has become a bit shallower, but between the, the small surface area, it being relatively deep, um, and then the hyper eutrophic nature, um, which induces strong stratification because it gets so cloudy that the, the depths or, or the bottom waters um, become anoxic uh, and really low, uh, you know, the, the mixing layer doesn't quite reach the bottom of the depths. Um, so it, it's this anoxic uh, bottom waters of low disturbance and the very high productivity above that is just raining down organic matter that switches from um, largely diatom valves in those light colored layers, as well as um, appetite is the mineral. And it's just uh, precipitating directly out of the water column and sinking. And then the dark layers represent the winter or you know ice covered layer where it's maybe not as productive in the appetite, but still quite organically productive. Um, so between being really deep, strongly stratified, and highly productive, um, it just forms these very rhythmic and quite thick. Or I think the average was something close to a centimeter thick uh, per varve. Great. Um, I'd like to take this next moment to mention that uh, Maria Caravedo, excuse me if I'm pronouncing her name badly, um, wanted to mention that she and Dr. Rosa Trabajo with some colleagues have created a network of Spanish speaking diatomologists. Um, and hopefully Maria will share that information um, for communication with them. 
and I believe Sarah is trying to get them to do to hold a Dietown Web Academy <laughs> in Spanish. So we'll hear about that as well. Um, hopefully. There were several people who are interested in getting a hold of some of your 3D models. Um, are you providing them? Are you selling them? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the simplest way, um, if you're talking physical 3D models, like physical printed models, 3D models, yeah, I don't have really the capability to sell them. You know, I don't have like a printer, but somewhere in here was a link to Thingiverse. Um, where you can download the models. And so let's see, where was it? So if we go to this website, Thingiverse, um, and search for diatoms, uh, there's a number of individuals that have 3D models on here. Um, mine are under these. So here I'm Joe Mohan, paleontologist on Thingiverse. Uh, and these are free to use, download, print them out. Um, and if you don't have access to a printer, I think the easiest way or the most generally available 3D printers are usually at public libraries. Mm -hmm. uh, they tend to have a large number of these. Yeah. Um, Sarah, can we provide the link to that on the webinar website or elsewhere? So there's a few. Um, if you do have like a specific model or species, you know, favorite species, uh, you could feel free to reach out to me, send me an email. Um, and if I have some downtime, I can put one together. Uh, or I would, I would also encourage you to hop on Tinkercad and, um, you know, try your hand at making some. Thank you, Joe. If you didn't notice, Joe did put the uh, link to that website in the chat. So it's there for you and we'll try to get it up on um, Dona as well. Are there any further questions or comments for Joe? A lot of people are happy with the presentation. <laughs> Great. Well, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, yeah, that was great. And the, the uh, potential is, is really exciting. Actually, do you want to finish up? Do you have any idea of what direction you're going to be heading with your current postdoc? Uh, many directions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this was kind of the, the uh, multiple project postdoc. Um, so it'll, it'll have a lot of directions, um, some of which contributing to the, um, the donor website, uh, exploring diatoms in Lake Superior, some Didymo, Senia. So right. uh, I, I guess That's I cool. would probably say the next model is going to be a Didymo Senia. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> I look forward to that. <laughs> All right. I'll ask David or Sarah as to how to officially um... <laughs> you you got talk. that. No, okay. it's, it was a great talk, Joe, and thanks for speaking today. Um, I have a couple more questions for you, but I think we'll have plenty of opportunities to talk about them in the near future. Um, but some, yeah, just a very interesting talk and a wide variety of applications. Thanks yeah. a lot for talking today. Yeah, very exciting to think about. Yeah, thanks Thank for, you so much, for having me on. Thanks, everyone, for being here. <laughs>